The broadcast is now starting. Good evening, Attendees everybody. Welcome to the mode. Goodfellow Innovations and in Managing Childhood Eczema webinar. Uh, this has been the, the contents developed by the Goodfellow unit, but the funding for this has been provided by Farmag. Uh, my guest tonight is Jessica Tiplady to my right here. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. Jessica was a new grad nurse in our clinic at Greenstone Clinic in Manurewa. Then she became a full primary care nurse, and at the moment she's training to be a nurse practitioner and uh, will be going for her exams in March next year. So welcome, Jess. Thank you. Okay, now I'm just going to... Um, just go through some of the Goodfellow products. So this is our website, and we've got the online catalogue there. We've got Goodfellow Clinics, and down here we've got recommended health websites. There's a whole lot of uh, virtually all free recommended health websites that you might like to look at. If you go over to Goodfellow Clinics, you find this information here. So these are our gems, and hopefully uh, you've got the mail uh, the gym today, uh, stop using topical antibiotics, so we're going to talk about that tonight. We welcome any questions on that, but you can see the last ones actually have been about diagnoses, monogenic diabetes, uh, neurological itch. I've actually seen two patients with neurological itch since I sent that gem out. So if you sign up to goodfellowunit.org, you get on our gym's mail base and you get one of these every two weeks. They're a practice changing fact. There's our podcasts, and over on the right here, you can, if you're not listening to podcasts, you can listen to them on the computer or you can listen to them in the car. And I get a great deal of pleasure driving around Auckland listening to podcasts. Uh, and being stuck in traffic is much more pleasurable when you've got a podcast, believe me. And it's, uh, if you're having trouble signing up, have a look over here. Uh, or if worse comes to worse, send us an email and we can walk you through it by phone. Uh, these podcasts come out every one to two weeks. We've got a couple there on nutrition. We've got anorexia uh, and depression in adolescence. There's a couple of new ones since that. Uh, we have the, if you go to YouTube and, and put in Goodfellow Unit, you can see some of the videos recorded from last year's uh, um, so this year's symposium, so they're about 45 minutes long, 54 minutes. So there's a whole lot of uh, webinars there. Sorry, uh, videos. Okay, so we're on to um, innovations in managing eczema. Now on your sidebar at the side of your screen is a box which you can type in questions. We've got one question already, but we'll, we'll um, chonk on through. Um, the slides and then just take the questions ideally as they come in. So I'd just like to start off with, um, so the innovation at Greenstone has been in setting up a nurse-led clinic. Can you just walk us through how that came about, Jess? Yes, yeah, so I guess that um, the problem was identified about five years ago by one of the practice partners, Tana Fishman, um, and the, the problem she identified was that children were coming in I guess in a state of crisis, um, either they were having an acute flare of the eczema um, or they had an infection with the eczema. Um, and overwhelmingly, families were confused by their regimes, um, by what creams to use when. Um, and because they were coming in in crisis, they were often coming into our emergency clinic where there wasn't a lot of time to spend with people um, talking about the management of eczema. Um, and the other thing we noted as well is that the more prescribers our children saw, um, the more different creams and steroid um, ointments or creams they were given. Um, so that kind of added to the confusion, I guess. Um, so I sat down as a, as a young new graduate nurse to try and figure out what the solution to the problem was. Um, and I guess I felt quite strongly that the confusion was what was driving the problem, and so the answer was information and education. Um, so it wasn't about it being necessarily a nurse-led initiative, but about all clinicians giving similar messages and clear information to families so that they could manage their eczema. 
Um, and it's grown as I've grown a little bit as well. So it's now a lot of training our new clinicians who are coming through. So our new graduate nurses, our medical students and nursing students and our registrars as well. Um, but I guess the cornerstone of our clinic is around providing families with eczema care plans um, because I think that's a really good guide that all clinicians are using similar information um, but also it's, uh, it's a measurable thing to do as well so I can look at um, who's receiving the education around the eczema. So you, we've got the eczema clear plan up on the screen there. Would you like to tell the audience where they can find this and because I think we've made a link at the end haven't we? We have, yes. Uh, so it's on the links um, uh, which should be on your website as you look at the, at the screen um, and this is from Starship I think isn't it? Yes it is and so this is the um, plan that we always use um, but it is on the Eczema Clinical Network through the Starship website. You can download this as well as an information sheet that is laid out very similar to this around managing eczema. So could you walk us through what the key points are? Um, yeah, and the reason we use this eczema care plan, I guess, is because I think if families can follow these steps, they're on a really good path as far as managing their eczema. Um, one of the things I like about it is that it puts it into the order of how families do things, so starting with bathing or showering. Um, it is alterable so we can kind of customise it to our families um, and I guess the other thing I really like about it is um, the fact that it includes the antiseptic baths um, but we also give extra information around that but also the um, encouragement to moisturise as often as you can every day. Right and then you've got some, you're you saying, so you've been able to sort of standardise your steroid package for patients because you were saying before all the GPs were doing different things now that the patients come through you, they it's a much more, it's a standardised pathway. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, but I'm saying that we also use what what has worked in the past for families and what they're familiar with as well, um, if it's an appropriate strength of steroid. Right, because I guess they might have come in from another practice yeah. with a steroid that we, yeah. we perhaps don't... Um, and often families will say, I've got, I've got a goldy coloured one and a yellow and white one, so that's where we start. Yeah, but that's relatively easy. But it's the yeah. it's the other the other <laughs> colours. Shall we move on to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, comment here about just how common it is. Certainly, in my family, it's very common. Absolutely, and this stuff is from the um, Isaac studies that were based. Um, so this is New Zealand data, but around a quarter of us. Um, as children have ever had eczema and around 15% have had current eczema um, and it does, it presents early so in our um, preschool children and in particular our under ones um, and that's where I think nurses have a massive role because um, we have a lot of contact with these children um, before they hit one as far as vaccinations and wild child checks and things like that go so we often see these families right as eczema is developing and right where questions are kind of being formed. And you were saying to me before you found with these families that they they once they're into your clinic they're less likely to present in crisis. That's yeah that's the major goal is to give families um, tools to know when the eczema is getting worse, um, the knowledge that they don't ever have to run out of cream so if they're running low but for some reason they can't get into the clinic we can top them up. Um, but I guess also as they as they come to understand my role or the role of the nurses, they also know if the docs are full, they can just come and see me for their eczema management or any one of the nurses. And certainly the patients, when I say to them, have you seen Jess, those who have seen you, um, you know, like the clinic very much. So it's got a high acceptability in the mm. clinic. And um, we think we may have had a small... Muted. Unmuted. Okay, uh, a small reduction in admissions to hospital. We had two two elective admissions. You were saying. Yeah, so two. Um, so we had five admissions in total in the last year. Um, two were planned via the paediatric um, clinic. One was actually a, a presentation with a viral illness, but they managed the eczema while they were in as well. Okay, so we've got some interesting questions coming through. Those of you who are sending in questions, keep them coming, but we'll deal with them as we um, as we come in. Um, so uh, I wonder if it's just worth dealing with the, the Foban issue, just given the li in line with um, mm. with uh, the the um, gem today. 
Did you using want... topical, yeah, mm. to topical role of to topical antibiotics in eczema. Um, and I must say, our pathways still reference topical antibiotics, particularly with um, small areas of infection. I don't particularly like topical antibiotics, and we've got a slide coming up later around resistance and topical antibiotics, um, and the fact that they do really drive our resistance rates. Um, and okay. really they should be being kept for nasal decontamination mm. rather than used topically. That, yeah. yeah, that's my understanding. There is a research um, study happening in Auckland at the moment to compare whether um, Christicide or Foban or actually just cleaning and covering school sores, um, which of the interventions is most effective. Mm. They're, they're certainly effective. The issue is that the resistance is going to blow them out of the water if we keep using them, and then we'll have nothing to use for uh, nasal carriage eradication. Interestingly, looking at the national figures, uh, fusidic acid or Foban is the second highest uh, topical uh, medication prescribed after locoid or hydrocortisone butyrate. So uh, we've got a long way to go if we're going to uh, reduce that, but I would uh, invite the audience um, to uh, to consider either using hydrogen peroxide, which is cristicide, iodine, topical antiseptics, or if it's that bad thing and you want to get rid of the uh, the um, the infection, is use oral antibiotics, mm -hmm. and probably just for short you know for short courses. If it's that minor, uh, five days is what people like Mark Thomas are recommending now. So um, okay, so let's uh, assessment of eczema. Yeah, so we thought we'd talk really briefly about, um, I guess, eczema diagnosis. Um, and I think Bruce has a reference to the Red Rash Made Easy um, page as well. Um, but in essence, eczema is itchy. Um, and if it's not itchy, then we're probably looking at something else. Um, and I guess the main four differentials for other itchy rashes would be things like urticaria and insect bites and potentially scabies as well. Um, but children who have a history of dermatitis or a visible dermatitis, um, and particularly if um, the symptoms set in under the age of two or there's a family history of or personal history of kind of atopy type symptoms. Um, and it, but I guess my view around eczema is it's not just around the diagnosis but also around the impact that it has as well. Um, so we do look at severity and extent and I think that's where our maps um, are quite helpful, our distribution maps. But also one of the things we look at when we're doing our eczema assessments is um, how many nights a week are children waking due to their itch, have they missed any days of school or daycare because of their eczema, um, and how many courses of antibiotics have they needed as kind of, I guess, proxy measures of control once we do have the diagnosis of eczema. Right. Um, there is a qu We had a question about uh, is what we're talking about following the eczema pathways, and, and it would be other than for the... Um, the, uh, the topical use of antibiotics for small areas. There's a move away from it. So people like Emma Best in Auckland and Mark Thomas, whose name are on the gem, uh, would, would suggest moving away from, from using that because there's an awful lot of topical phobam being used. 180,000 um, prescriptions last year. So we've got a long way to go if we're going to um, reduce that. So that's quite important. So there, there, are, there are functional and behavioural impacts mm. on families. So it is quite important to um, to get these things. But that was interesting what you said about diagnosing itchiness. There, uh, we're going to go on to the red rash made easy at the end of this talk, uh, but there's only four things that are very itchy, eczema being one of them. As you said, scabies, insect bites, or urticaria. So if you're in primary care and you've got something that doesn't fit those four things, either you've missed the diagnosis or it's something pretty weird, and you probably need to talk to a dermatologist in that in that sort of situation. So, um, so where is the place in uh, Bactroban in this? Same as um, uh, as fusilic acid, mm. uh, and again, there's a part charge on that, so it's it's less. Again, I think I, I just keep the Bactroban for nasal carriage um, uh, elimination. And ideally, that should be based on a bacteriological swab rather than just putting, certainly putting uh, topical antibiotics on eczema 
mm -hmm. uh, is not is not desirable. Mm -hmm. Oral antibiotics would be. Um, and the skin infection pathways for children, the or the Auckland Regional Pathways, do recommend doing a, a swab of the nose first before you go to Bactrovan over Fovan. Why is there a reason for that? Because Bactrovan is more likely to strep, I think, isn't it? Rather yeah. than staph. Yeah. So I think they're saying to save it for. Yeah. Those yeah, because those of you will recall when Bactroban went available uh, over the counter, the resistance rates just went uh, went rocketing up. Um, so I think we have to be cognizant, and I think this week is Antibiotic Resistance Week. Oh, okay. um, yeah, it's international. Um, so we don't want to be the last generation with antibiotics that work. Next slide. Yes, and I guess this slide was to labour the point around the impact of eczema. Um, because it's so common, I think often the impact of it is underestimated. So this was data from the Isaac trials um, for the six to seven year olds in particular. Um, and so this was around um, prevalence of eczema and severe eczema. Um, and interestingly, these guys class severe eczema as having active eczema um, and waking on one or more nights of the week due to the eczema. Um, so our Māori children are three times more likely to be waking each night or one or more nights of the week due to eczema and our Pacific children were over five times more likely to be waking. Um, so like many things there is a, um, an inequity present. Um, and it was interesting, there was one study that looked at the impact of eczema compared to other chronic childhood conditions and skin conditions. Um, and when they looked at impact on quality of life, and they measured quality of life by um, able to attend activities with their friends, sleep, um, able to attend school, widespread and severe eczema had an impact on the quality of life of children second only to cerebral palsy. So wow. it was, yeah, it was, I guess, quite eye-opening for me mm. as a young nurse to read about these things because I thought, oh, yeah, everyone has eczema and it's, this is going to be a nice, easy project for me. <laughs> okay, a uh, question now, would you recommend uh, hydrogen peroxide for nasal uh, decontamination? Probably not because it, because it's, it's a bit more irritating, I think, and that's probably the downside of... Um, uh, of that, so, um, but it may be just as effective. I don't think anybody, anybody studied that. So, mm. um, so to some extent, we're waiting on Emma Best's randomised trial um, on the antibiotic issue. Okay, topical problem. Um, so we thought that we would go through, um, I guess, step by step, in the same way that we would go through with a family. Um, so some education around how to best manage eczema um, and I really loved the BPAC article that came out a year ago around eczema because it did its title was it's a topical issue because we've all always got questions around eczema but it's got a topical solution um, and that was really getting at the idea that whilst eczema is multifactorial and it's in its cause and its origin um, there are new developments around understanding why children might develop eczema um, and one of those um, new developments was around the role of the filagrin protein in the skin um, and the fact that some children who are born with um, with deficiencies in the protein um, are more likely to have much drier skin and go on to develop eczema so it is it is a skin problem do you have anything to add Chris? Uh, no no Okay. So the place that we always start with is around cleaning the skin um, and absolutely children with eczema can bath every day um, and they certainly don't need to bath in cold baths, they can bath in warm baths um, and I guess the main education we use around cleaning the skin is, is avoiding soaps, bubble baths and anything that's perfumed or irritating um, and instead using moisturisers or non-soap products for cleaning. Um, I do see a lot of um, emulsifying ointment and aqueous cream being prescribed as soap substitutes um, and as you probably know with the sodium lauryl sulfate in the, in the, in the aqueous cream um, we don't use them as moisturisers but they can be used as, as soap substitutes. 
I guess my view is to keep things really simple. So often I will give families um, something like acetamacrogol or, or an emollient they can leave on the skin and encourage them to use it as a soap substitute as well. Um, and the other thing we often talk about is around bleach bathing for children twice a week to reduce the staph carriage on their skin because children with eczema will have a lot more staph on their skin um, but also with the scratching there's constant insults to the barrier function of the skin um, making them more prone to infections. The link is here but it'll also be at the end of the um, presentation around the bleach bathing handout that's been developed by Starship um, and it's got really really good step-by-step -step guides around concentrations of bleach, actually the brand of bleach we need to buy um, because the, the Janola does have soaps in it that can irritate the skin um, and how to go about bleach bathing. Question about shampoos, mm. any, any um, suggestions in that department? That's tricky because often our children do develop a bit of scalp dermatitis or eczema as well as they get older. Um, in small children, we generally just use the, um, you know, the same wash-off emollient in the hair as we do in the, on the body. I'm not sure with older children, Bruce. Do you use anything in particular? No, I haven't really seen it as, a, a, you know, more of a problem. I think in, in psoriasis, but mm. there are the odd person where there, where there's a bit of a bit of overlap there, mm, so I mm. don't think um, there's any easy answer to that. Do you want to say something about the different emollients at this point? Is that, or should we wait till we... Um, I think that might be the next slide. Next slide, okay, <laughs> good, okay, next slide. So here, here we've got a young child who's answered the question, uh, the child's plastered emollient all over their, uh, their scalp. But um, speak to the slide. And so I, the main message around emollients is to be encouraging families to use them as liberally as possible and as frequently as possible. Um, definitely, definitely moisturising straight after they get out of the bath. Um, encouraging children where they can to participate in applying their creams. Though obviously, as this picture shows, not unaided. Um, and if you are using one of the pottle emollients, like the fatty cream or the non-ionic cream, to make sure that we're scooping the cream out of the tub before applying it to our family, uh, to the children's skin, just to make sure those tubs aren't becoming reservoirs of bacteria and infection. Um, and we're aiming to use, depending on the size of the child, sorry, that should be 250 to 500 grams a week. So one of our um, 500 gram tubs every kind of fortnight is something that I think families can be aiming for. And actually us nurses keep an, a sample of each of these emollients in our office um, so families can have a feel of them and, and get a sense as to which one they like. Um, but we also demonstrate with families how to apply the emollients. Um, and I guess it does depend how much time you've got with families. If you are a little bit time poor, um, there are really fabulous videos on the Kids Health website as well, which you've got a link to at the end, um, which has Diana Purvis, who's the paediatric dermatologist, sitting down with a family and teaching them how to apply their steroid creams, how to apply their emollients. Um, but I do think that that is really important um, because, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching people how to take their tablets. We spend a lot of time teaching people how to take their inhalers for their asthma. Um, but traditionally, we haven't shown people how to use their topical treatments. Have you talked about the sodium laurel sulfate? Um, just briefly when we're talking Cause about... There's this a question here that um, current, this is from Marie, who's a pharmacist, Current funded aqueous cream is SLS free. Oh, that's really interesting because I did know that the SLS free aqueous cream was coming. Okay. Um, and we were given a wee sample of it a little while ago, but I wasn't aware that it is so now it sounds, yeah. funded. So if you're going to use aqueous cream, it needs to be the SLS free. But what's the problem with sodium laurel sulfate? Um, so it's my understanding from what I've read that sodium lauryl sulfate is an irritant to the skin um, and when it was in aqueous, the aqueous um, cream was considered to be irritating to children with eczema um, and they were found to have, um, it actually increased the rates of um, water loss through the skin rather than stopping the rates of water loss which is what our, the goal of our moisturisers are. And the other one was the emulsifying ointment. Yeah, so emulsifying ointment did have SLS in it, and I, I, it's my understanding that it still does. So what would you recommend as the, what, 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 what's your preference for uh, emulsifying lotions for the skin and for the soap substitute? 
Um, I guess I like to use the same thing as a soap as I do as a moisturiser because I think that makes um, the more simplified we can get things the easier and also it means less creams and bottles and things in the bathroom. Um, I really like the Sorbeline because of the pump bottle that it comes in. I think it's quite um, good as far as an infection control device. Um, the fatty cream um, or the thicker emollients are good as far as trapping water in the skin layer. Um, but I think it really does depend on what families like, and that's why mm. I think it's good for them to have a play around with it, um, because if it's not going to be used, then it's not going to be effective. Yeah, uh, there's a question here about Cetaphil. Now, I, I, I suffer from eczema, and I like Cetaphil, but it's quite expensive, mm. and uh, the, thing, the reason I like it is because it dries pretty quickly, mm. and it doesn't it's non -greasy. So, it's non-greasy, but when you look at what's in it, there's about... Um, you know, 15 to 20 different compounds in it and does sort of, um, but do you, w would you ever recommend that to a patient because of the cost or? Um, um, I do lean heavily towards funded emollients because of the cost barrier. Um, we've got several patients who do choose to self-fund their emollients. Yep. Um, one of them was using a vino on it, so I looked into the pricing around that. Um, and we worked out it was between, if you were buying it from the supermarket, it was going to be between $13 and $26 um, a week per child for the emollient. So that's, oh, that's a lot, a you know, if you're using enough of your emollient, having a non-funded one is quite cost prohibitive, I think. Um, but in saying that, again, it's really what the family, it should be led by the family because we want it to be used as much as possible. We've just got one comment here about a shampoo called Dermasoft. It's about $18 a bottle, and it doesn't, I just looked up here on the web, it doesn't create, it doesn't contain sodium laurel sulfate, and it's marketed as a, um, a moisturizing shampoo, mm. supposedly low allergy, but um, uh, I guess with some of these things, you might just have to try them and see what, um, uh, I mean, there's probably no reason not to initially just use regular shampoo, is there? Mm. And then if you're having problems, then, then start, moving up the uh, the price barrier mm. so um, but this is a fabulous forum for learning cause yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great so the uh, the audience has many of the answers so mm. that's good that's what we like should we go over uh, uh, yes no absolutely. okay so on to the um the inflammation yes so this is very um topical um and me and bruce have been discussing over the last couple of weeks just how much is written around people's fear of phobia, um, sorry, fear of steroid creams, um, and that the perceived risks for a lot of families seem to outweigh the perceived benefits. Um, and in that sense, I think they're the, they're the opposite of antibiotics, aren't they? Because often the perceived benefits of antibiotics are far overvalued. Um, and so this is why I think underuse of steroid creams is far more of an issue or tends to be more of a prevalent concern than overuse of steroid creams. Um, and I think um, I think that's where as, as a nurse but all clinicians have a role in understanding um, strengths of steroid creams and what is appropriate use um, and really empowering families to use these creams appropriately as a treatment for inflammation um, without fear of side effects or, or damage to the skin. Um, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I just, I've just been aware of some clinicians being very scared about using it on the eyelids. Um, and we know that even hydrocortisone used long term can cause problems on the eyelids. But we had a patient in our clinic who was not getting doing very well from uh, from hydrocortisone on the eyelids, and she was going crazy. She had a couple of kids, and I uh, talked to Paul uh, Jarrett about that, and he suggested just bumping up to one of the um, the more potent steroids. He suggested Umavate, which is clobetasol. Um, uh, butyrate, and I think we have to be careful from the clobetasol mm. dipropionate, which is the old dermavate, which is a very, um, very potent steroid. But just going to something um, a little bit strong. And I think we've actually got the next slide with, the steroid ladder. with, with the steroid ladder, um, and there's there's a number of points we need to talk about there. So this is the steroid ladder from Dermnet, and I think this is, so there's the New Zealand formulary have a steroid ladder, Dermnet, um, there's one on BPAC as well, um, but I think this is probably the easiest to access when you're um, 
busy in a consult, um, but I think this is, like Bruce said, not confusing the clobetazone butyrate with the clobetazole propionate, um, and also the other one would be the hydrocortisone versus the hydrocortisone butyrate, which is the low coit. Um, yeah, that's a potent steroid, so mm. that's, a, that's a trap for players. Patients start using it on their faces, mm. and uh, we've had at least one patient in our clinic who's um, ended up with steroid damage. And I think that's an important point. I know when I'm doing repeat prescriptions for people and repeating steroids, I always make sure uh, to put a limit that not to be used on the face or only to be used on the face for up to, and I take I take a guess at this, two weeks is normally what I say, because I think if they're not getting better in two weeks, you might want to reassess what's mm -hmm. going on. You know, may have the diagnosis wrong. Uh, there may be something else going on for that mm -hmm. patient. But there is a risk of people... You know, they're, they're, they apply it on their body and they find it actually helps the little skin damage and dings we get as we get older and they start using it and then they end up with steroids. This was a 60-year-old man. I don't know why he started using it on his face, but it hadn't been prescribed for his face. He just started mm. using it and um, and then turned up one day with telangiectasia and atrophy. So. Oh, gosh, that's awful. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously is a risk of using potent steroids um, in, in, in appropriate places or, in, or inappropriately. Um, one of the interesting things that I've been, um, I guess, looking at or learning about um, is the hypopigmentation, so the white patches on people's skin, um, and often this being a result of the eczema rather than of overuse of the steroids. So that can really kind of make us a bit gun shy, I think, sometimes, but understanding that's part of the inflammatory process and part of the eczema rather than the steroid use that we're using. Um, we were talking, Bruce, about ointments versus creams, um, and also many of these come in lotions as well, because obviously the vehicle that the steroid is in is quite important as well. Um, ointments generally being um, thicker and more moisturising, but also having greater absorption of the steroids, so making the steroid itself slightly sh more effective, I guess, um, but also creams sometimes being a little bit more um, acceptable to families and patients when they're putting them on. Is that your Well, that, that, yeah, that, that's my experience. Uh, people, ointments obviously uh, have greater potency, um, you know, dose for dose, but it is, it's not very pleasant cosmetically get stuck on clothes, whereas creams are much more. I just wonder if we just, just, just go over the, the, the steroid ladder here. So we've got the hydrocortisones down here, which are, uh, are safe in, in, in short courses anywhere on the body except the eyelids. Once you get up here, you're starting to get into the moderate ones, and these are quite a bit more potent than hydrocortisone. The clobetazone butyrate is the old name of, of Umivate, and then we step up to the next to the potent ones. These are 100 to 150 times. Um, do you want to say a word about methylprednisolone? Because we checked this with Paul Jarrett. And we did. So methylprednisolone um, is, is it was marketed as Advantin. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that we were, um, it was quite widely spread, um, mostly by the company who were marketing it, that it was safe to use on the face. Um, because of the way that it was metabolized as it was being absorbed into the skin, that it was less likely to give kind of adverse effects but be more effective than some of our other potent steroids. So therefore we could use it on small children and also um, on faces. Um, but when we reviewed that with the dermatologist, or Bruce kindly reviewed that, um, it is a potent steroid um, and it shouldn't be used on the face or mm. on small children. And actually when mimetazone first came out, it was marketed in the same way. Way. Um, and not many of us would be brave enough to put mimetazone on a face. Well, that's right. I think, <laughs> well, for short periods of time, I think is absolutely mm. fine, but it's it's long term. Yeah. I think the key thing, if it's not getting better with whatever you're doing, you need to step back and think, have I got the right diagnosis? Mm. Have I got the right potency? Have I got the right vehicle? Um, and is it being applied correctly and, yeah. and is the compliance there as well because yeah. that's another issue. And Marie's asked a question here about using topical steroids sparingly and mm. for those of you who heard Paul Jarrett on the podcast, we've got two podcasts by Paul Jarrett, uh, he says it has these things need to be applied thickly to the skin and he feels once a day is enough um, but sometimes twice a day can help if, if, if the patient's not getting any better. Uh, but just going back up the ladder here, so that's Advantan, that's
that's uh, the old um, Elecon. Elecon. That's locoid, di diflucortisone for cologne valerate. I'm not sure what that is. Do you know what the trade name of that is? No, no. Betamethasone yeah. dipropionate and betamethasone valerate. That's the beta. So that's that's pretty common. The only problem I find with that, with the ointment of that one, is it's hard to get out of the tube. Mm. You need to run it under a hot tap. Then you get up to the heavy duty stuff, and this stuff really you have to be careful about um, anywhere on the body long term. That's the old Dermavate, and that's the old. Um, I remember what the old name of that one is? Somebody will come up with it. Uh, it Dermol. Yeah. Dermol now, yeah, yeah, and that's I've forgotten what the uh, sure. yeah. And certainly those wouldn't be generally um, recommended in children at all without kind of dermatology overseeing yeah. that. They, they are prescribed. There are 103,000 prescriptions of uh, Dermol. So, um, uh, and so the, there is a lot of it used. So, but as you say, probably should be avoided in children. The NICE guidelines have quite a simple kind of um, recommendation as far as choosing steroids for eczema on the body by age group. I mean, I find it, obviously, there is a bit of clinical judgment there, um, but I find it a good rule to um, to, to know um, and to think about when you are choosing or, or reviewing steroid regimes, which is more what I'm doing. Um, so they generally say um, for school-age children... Um, Oh, sorry, for under one year, generally your low potency, so your hydrocortisone should be sufficient. Um, sometimes in your preschool children, you need to go up to a moderate or occasionally a potent steroid on the body. Um, and for school-age children, often we are looking at the potent steroids on the body um, because it is better to use a potent steroid for a short, sharp burst than long courses of hydrocortisone, which gives increased steroid exposure overall. Okay, so I've got some good questions here. Do the steroids go over the emollient or before using the emollient? I've read lots of different advice around this, and I'm not sure if you have an opinion, Bruce, because um, the other the other advice you often hear is to leave 20 minutes in between your in between your emollient and your steroid, and I think if you're going to do that, only one is ever going to make it onto the skin. <laughs> well, I think children. Paul Jones says that mixing them up, um, unless you do a massive dilution, doesn't doesn't mm. destroy the potency, so it probably doesn't matter if they go close together. Mm. Um, I fact. generally say to families to put the steroid on first because you own, uh, sorry, the emollient on first because you want, you want the emollient everywhere on the body, um, but you only want the steroid on the inflamed areas of the body. So that way it's easier to kind of keep the steroid creams where you want them to be rather than accidentally spreading them all over the body. Um, but also the absorption of steroids is better in well-moisturized skin as well. So question here, recurrent eczema on the face, uh, no better with hydrocortisone what to do. And I think we talked about that going up to a more potent steroid like clobetazone or triamcinolone, which are a bit more potent. Um, you may want to go even higher. You may want to talk to a dermatologist about that. The other option and it's very expensive, it's about $50 a tube is Elodil, um, which is a calcineurin inhibitor, um, which is about as good as, as I think a moderate potent steroid. They're not, they're, not, um, they're not fantastically effective, they just don't have that problem of, uh, of steroid damage. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are some alternatives, but I think, uh, you know, I think a reasonable take home message would be short courses of steroids on the face aren't a problem. It's just when you go on, and I guess nobody really knows quite what a long term is, but mm. I get twitchy after two weeks. And I think if someone's not getting better after a couple of weeks, you probably need to discuss it with somebody. I don't know what you think. Would you? Mm. Certainly um, our pathway around children and eczema is to review them every two weeks. Right. Um, so if you've got a child with severe or extensive eczema, to give them a plan and to follow them up in two weeks. The rationale being, yeah, you're not going to do any damage in two weeks with your steroid regime, generally. Um, but also, if things yeah, if things aren't improving, then we need to review. Is are they applying the creams appropriately? Can we remove any further triggers that might be exacerbating the eczema? Um, and if if we're removing all those things and things are continuing not to get better, then I feel really strongly that we should be liaising with either pediatrics or dermatology. Question here: Betamethasone dipropionate is listed under very potent and potent, which is accurate. I think 
uh, this has taken off NZF, we would say um, very, very potent. Um, that's always. Uh, Nerozone, a uh, dye flu, cortisone is Nerozone. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, and please comment on topical steroid medication for very young children, particularly faces and under 12 month old infants. So the babies often get born with that sebozo, sebero eczema, don't they? Which is a bit of a, a mix. Mm. And generally infants when they present with eczema have those very inflamed dramatic cheeks often, don't they? Um, so that is, um, or you know, or they have widely extensive eczema right over their bodies, but often they have the very red angry cheeks. Um, and we generally start with a lot of moisturiser on those. Um, my sense is that a little bit of hydrocortisone on those bubbies is absolutely fine. Um, Eczema in an under six week old, we should really be thinking, could there be another another cause of the skin rash? Because that can, um, on our original pathways, eczema in under six weeks old is sometimes considered a bit of a red flag as far as thinking about um, more unusual things that they may have been born with. Okay. Now, so you, when you talk about the pathways, these are the Auckland Regional Pathways. Yeah, so these were, we used to have the flow diagram Auckland Regional Pathways, but we now have the, um, and actually we should put the link up at the end because you do need a username and a password, um, but it should have been widely distributed, the Auckland Regional Health Pathways. Um, so it's called aucklandregion.healthpathways.org.nz and the username is connected if you've got a pen and the password is healthcare. Um, I'm still continuously puzzled why you need a username and password for a public pathway, but that it seems was, to be the... Um, um, my understanding it was to do with the fact that um, the Greater Auckland Region um, or the Northern Regional Alliance had purchased some of the pathways from Canterbury, because um, obviously their pathways are very well known, yes. um, and somehow part of the... The deal was... The deal them. was a password okay. that we all share and we all tell everyone about. <laughs> Well, 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 I hope we're not going to get sued for um, for breaching copyright here. But anyway, um, it seems to me these are, are publicly funded uh, resources and the username is connected and password is healthcare. Okay, so um, do you still recommend body wraps? Now, I think that is really something that's done in hospital in New Zealand, isn't it? It's not really something recommended outside of hospital? Yeah, unfortunately, because wet wrapping is effective, um, but unfortunately it takes a lot of time and support, um, and there is very little kind of community-based funding for that time and support with families. Um, it is something I've noticed children who are admitted to hospital for wet wrapping often uh, do have a public health nurse who will support them to do that in the community, but it's not really considered standard primary care. Got a question here, what about recurrent infected eczema over the face? Do you use topical antibiotics or prefer oral antibiotics? One of the interesting things is with antibiotics is actually, as far as I'm aware, there are no randomised trials showing the antibiotics make any difference. They seem to help when things are really going bad. But I have to say one of the things I, I try and get our GP registrars to do is not reach for the antibiotic pad when they, they see something that looks infected because a lot of um, moderate to severe eczema looks infected. You have a few days of steroids on it and it can look it can look incredibly different. It, it looks not infected with a couple of days. So my feeling would be treat the eczema first. Um, if all else fails, then try. But again, not, not topical antibiotics. Uh, a short course of oral antibiotics, three to five days is probably all you would need in that situation. But I'd make a plea. I don't know what you would say about that. A plea to treat the eczema first, yeah. antibiotics second. I guess, yeah, like you said, careful assessment, because often eczema is open and red and angry, so can look infected. If it's weepy and pussy, then I guess that's a different story, and I would probably say antibiotics. I'm not sure if you would Well, I, I, I have a famous case of one of our registrars <laughs> with green pus behind an ear, and I managed to stop my registrar giving antibiotics and got him to put steroids on. And... Uh, Two or three days later, it looked completely different. It just, all the pus, all the the green stuff it got. Being green doesn't mean it's infected. It can just mean oxidised, uh, paralent tissue. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, I, I did have photographic proof of this, but the photograph of the improvement was out of focus. So oh, no. it's one of my great great disappointments. But um, 
I, I do discourage early antibiotics for things. You know, we just don't need antibiotics for all these things. The uh, the antibiotic holster ne uh, gun needs to be kept in the holster uh, a bit uh, and, and hold your nerve and try some topical steroids. Um, the other thing is, obviously, if you've got a very moist thing, is to check for herpes virus if you're worried about herpes uh, herpeticum. Mm, which we've got a slide on coming up, but I also saw a good um, recommendation to swab eczema if it's weeping. Yeah. Um, somebody here says, I tend to swab and start steroids while waiting for result, unless clear pustules. Um, I think what, there was something I was reading about this, that actually the problem with swabbing the skin, of course, you're going to find staph anyway, um, and whether that's actually causative or not, um, unless you think the child's in big trouble. But if the child's otherwise not looking terribly sick, then, I mean, my feeling would be to try the, try the steroids. Mm. Um, do you have a comment on the use of Pimifucort for those kind of hard-to-identify lesions? Well, uh, I have quite a strong view on Pimifucort. If you're giving Pimifucort, you're really saying, I don't know what I'm doing, and that's okay, but you're giving at least one drug they don't need, and you're probably giving two drugs they don't need. And if you have a look at the latest gem, it says, consider taking a swab or a skin scraping and trialing a topical steroid or an oral antibiotic. If you don't, if you, if you use single treatments, you will find out what the cause was, because if it gets better with Pimifucort, you don't know why it got better. And I think with Pimifucort, usually it's probably the steroid that works in most cases. Mm. I think things probably aren't infected, or if they are, they're mildly infected, and they're probably not fungal infections. Um, and I think, um, uh, I think Pimifucort is uh, not a medication to be used. Having said that, there were um, 159,000 prescriptions of it written last year. So to me, that's a lot of people saying they don't know what they're treating. So, um, so I, I would prefer to see it off the market, and I'm, I'm trying to do that, but that's not necessarily easy. So sorry to be so, um, so uh, forthright on that, but I really think um, it's not good medicine, basically. You're not getting a diagnosis. And as I say, I never used Pimifucort and haven't for many, many years. So um, um, thanks for that. Uh, Okay, I meant efficacy between dipotent steroids, beta versus mimetazone versus locoid. Do you have a view on that? Um, I think people really like, and this is something we've talked about before, but people really like locoid, don't they, because of the um, lipo cream that it's in. It's quite nice to yeah. apply for people. Um, but as Bruce mentioned, there is the risk of people thinking that it is just a hydrocortisone, so popping it on the face or on, on their infant. Um, and I think the, na the infant... name is deceptive as well, low cord. It makes it sound like it's low, low, low risk, and I think that's, um, that's a bit of a concern. Um, I think if you're not get, if, if one of them's not, well, there is this issue of tachyphylaxis, and I've seen it a few times in my career, that's where the skin develops antibodies to a particular cortisone. Um, and you just need to change to something within the same potency. So if your locoid stops working, then switch over to mimetazone or betamethazone. Um, I have to say, as a personal choice, I find the betamethazone the best, best of them all. But that's, uh, that's an end of one, and that's, uh, that's just my own personal uh, experience. So I don't know if there's any data on... Um, it's quite difficult to determine safety and efficacy of these things in comparison to each other, so um, that information's not um, not easily known. Okay, um, I see it prescribed often and completely agree. I hope that's Pimifucort. So, um, it may, I think so, it may um, be. so Carol, if that's what you're saying, uh, I'm with you on that one. So, uh, if we if we if two things could come out of this thing, if we stop prescribing Foban and we stop prescribing Pimifucort. I think this would be a successful webinar. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, we well, see a lot of 10% beta and acetamacrogol cream as a moisturiser prescribed by specialists. I think our patient who's just been discharged from hospital yeah. has come out on that, has no, he came out on clobetazole, wasn't he? Yeah. It? yeah. Um, so my um, understanding is that when we dilute steroid creams in moisturisers, we don't dilute the potency. So to mix clobetazole with a 
moisturizer it's still a very potent steroid um, but I also see it quite a lot coming out of the dermatology clinics um, often it's a 50-50 mix so 50% cetamacrogol 50% potent or super potent steroid um, and that's for ease of application when um, having to apply to large surface areas is my understanding um, but it's still certainly a strong or potent steroid so it's important not to um, think that it has been diluted or weakened in any way. So the, um, the, other, the other combination um, is betamethasone with clioquinol. Clioquinol is a um, antifungal which uh, there's only 3,000 prescription for that but I don't think um, uh, I'm surprised that one's still on the market. But the other one is betamethasone with fusidic acid and my saying my comment about um, uh, Pema Foucault would go for that, that's Butacord I think isn't it, by another name, and um, we don't use that ever and uh, again you're just missing, the, you're potentially missing the diagnosis and if it works of course then the patient's going to keep wanting it forever whereas I suspect it's just the cortisone that's actually working and the antibiotic is irrelevant and then you're just raising this, this spectre of, uh, of resistance. So, um, so I think we're running out of questions about, um, uh, oh um, which one is safe to apply around the lip of a child under 10 years? Do you have a view on that? Um, I would always start with hydrocortisone um, because usually that is um, enough to settle the inflammation, um, even in adults. So I would start with hydrocortisone always on the face um, and limit, limit the time that people are using it, um, but get them back to check. Okay, question here, which which is right in your ballpark with your nursing and nurse practitioner thing. Do you recommend the chickenpox vaccine to children and babies with eczema because um, of the risk of getting, because of the problems with itchy skin? Mm, um, I, I recommend the varicella vaccination. I can't say that I've been particularly targeting our children with eczema around varicella vaccination, and I think that is actually a really good point. The one time I ever thought I saw eczema hepaticum, it was varicella and uh, also chickenpox and overlying eczema. Right. Yeah. Um, but it can, yeah, it can be quite nasty, can't it? Yeah. So pine tassel baths. Do you have any comments on that? I don't tend to use pine tassel baths because I tend to recommend antiseptic baths, so bleach bathing and things like that. Um, but if families have found it helpful in the past and they want to continue using it, then I will ask our doctors to prescribe it for the family. Question here for Marianne. So to be clear, are you saying that we as pharmacists should not put apply thinly on our labels anymore? Well, Paul Jarrett would say that's the case, um, but I don't know quite what the politics are of um, of making that suggestion, but that, mm. that comes straight from... Um, it is in the New Zealand formulary as well. When you're looking yeah. up a steroid cream, it still says in the instructions to apply sparingly. So it's a bit tricky. So I've had great success putting Vaseline on very dry eyelids and around the mouth after the sorbeling. I think that's a fabulous recommendation because um, Vaseline is so very benign, it doesn't seem to irritate anybody's skin, including children with eczema. So I'm very pro-Vaseline. Okay, for infected in eczema, do steroids need to be stopped? Um, the guidance from Starship is no, to continue with the steroids while you're treating with oral antibiotics. Um, I must say there's been some cases where children have very, very open weeping um, areas that are really open sores rather than inflamed skin um, where it's been very uncomfortable for them to put the steroid on so then I'll say just to pull back a little bit on those areas but there's no reason to say stop the steroid um, while they're taking the antibiotics. Again there's a thing about the weekend pulses do you want to say a bit about... Yes um... that was our next um, our next point actually was how to apply steroids um, and so we can talk about fingertip units and those sorts of things later, but the weekend pulsing is, I think, really important, um, a really fabulous development that families seem to really like as well. Um, so what we mean by weekend pulsing or weekend treatment is getting the flare of eczema under control with a steroid cream for, um, you know, one to two weeks or however long it, it takes to settle the flare. Um, but once your flare is settled, applying the steroid cream to any old or new patches of eczema 
um, for two days of the week. And it seems to be Saturday and Sunday make intrinsic sense because then people remember how many days to put it on. Um, but also we tend to not be at school and work and those sorts of things on the weekend mostly. Um, and in those kids, when they have a breakthrough, then you just treat that as it's a, as you, you just go back to daily yep. daily steroid until so it's only yeah. you only do the weekend stuff when it's under good control. Under good control. Um, and I did read um, about one review of I think it was a few different trials that use weekend pulsing for um, and measured children after 16 weeks, and there wasn't any issues with side effects at all using weekend pulsing. Um, and also. Um, the issue of the steroid not working or the tachyphylaxis stuff is less of an issue then, isn't it, as well? Because you're having it more than twice the days off steroid application than you are on steroid application. Yeah, there was something Paul Jarrett was very keen on mm. in one of his podcasts. He um, he talked about that. Now, yeah, and you... I found families are really keen on it as well because it gives them the power to stop the eczema coming back. Um, so I've every family I've talked about it, I think, has said, oh, that's a fabulous idea, I can, I can keep the eczema away or, or do something to try to keep the eczema away. Right. Now, we've got a few questions about diet. Do you When, when do you want to talk about that? I think diet is coming up. Okay, so the skin infection's there. So that's just showing the resistance going up to about 40% for staff with, with resistance. And it's I think it's the same with... Um, with Bactroban, and you can see it's just gone up as the number of prescriptions have gone up. So if I could ask you, New Zealand, to stop using Foban, I would love to see that graph going down. So I want to finish my career with reducing antibiotics. So please help us with that. So join the join the movement, please. Um, managing triggers? Yeah, so I think um, triggers with eczema work in a bit of a similar way to triggers with asthma and that we try and avoid them where possible. Um, but it's not always um, it's not always possible. I think the big ones are the soaps and the detergents and the chemicals. Um, so the things I talk to families about is using mild products or hypoallergenic products where they can. Um, I've had a couple of families who have had really great success with using additional rinse cycles for their child's clothing, um, just to get the last of the um, detergents out of the out of the um, clothing. Chlorine pools seem to be a big issue for our kids with eczema, um, but I don't ever like to tell children not to swim or not to um, attend swimming classes. So generally it's about when they jump out of the pool, rinsing off really thoroughly and making sure that they get that moisturizer on pretty quickly. Um, and where possible, loose cotton clothing, because overheating is a real trigger for itch. Um, yeah. And it seems to be those synthetic clothes that well, really... And, and I think wool just drives kids crazy, doesn't it? Right, it drives everybody crazy. <laughs> yeah, it drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so does this lead into food? Um, actually, I think it leads into itch. So should we flick over to the food and then we can come okay. back to itch? Okay. So you might just say the audience may be losing the bits on the end there, hypersensitive. Yeah, so this slide says um, around allergies and eczema, um, so this is a quote taken from our Health Point pathway before it became the Auckland Regional Pathways. So I'm not sure if it still has this exact word-for-word -word, um, statement. Um, but this was written by Diana Purvis, the paediatric dermatologist, and she was quite passionate about this, that unless the child has an immediate hypersensitivity reaction, so that's, you know, an immediate um, swelling or welts or those sorts of changes after eating a food, um, then we should not withhold specific foods in primary care because generally the harms of it withholding foods outweigh the benefits. Children with eczema certainly do have higher rates of food allergy, um, but generally the foods are not considered to be causative of the skin problems. The exception would probably be in our infants with very widespread severe eczema, um, but they generally are seen by peds and that's done at a secondary care level. Um, there is some talk around children with eczema because their skin barrier is less um, effective, um, that it's actually the dermal exposure to food products that may lead to the skin allergy, uh, sorry, the food allergy, but not the food allergy leading to the eczema. 
Just, Would that be your? Just explain that again. Um, so I have read a little bit, and I think it's kind of in the pathways. It's not really known, or um, but there are these hypotheses that maybe because children have um, a defect in their skin barrier, that when they're exposed to food allergens via the skin rather oh, than rather by than the, the mouth, mouth. Okay. Um, that can lead to sensitization gotcha. and allergy. Gotcha. Okay. Um, any role, role for allergy food testing? Um, generally, the um, like we said, the food allergy and the eczema often coexist, um, but generally the advice is to avoid skin prick testing or the RAS testing, um, particularly for panels of foods. Um, and I think actually lab tests don't do the panels anymore, do they? You have to ask for specific allergens um, because often they are falsely positive and then you start down the track of removing foods, which can be quite harmful. In terms of the nutritional um, mm. needs, yeah. So there's a question here. When do you start thinking about food allergies in kids with eczema? Parents very keen to try eliminating foods. If so, would it be reasonable to say try without dairy egg for two weeks, then reintroduce? What would you, if a parent came to you with that that scenario, what would you say? Yeah, I find this a really hard because it's, it is such a common question that families ask, isn't it? Is what food can I stop my child eating in order to improve their eczema? Um, but like we said, generally the advice is unless there's an immediate reaction, we shouldn't be withholding specific foods in primary care. But in saying that, the parent is um, ultimately responsible um, and they may try it on their own accord, but I think our role is to educate around that. Okay, and so you'd say the link between uh, dairy intolerance and allergy and skin eczema uh, is not strong? Um, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert, and I think if you were worried about that, you'd want to liaise with an immunologist or a paediatrician, um, but generally, whilst they often coexist, one is not generally causative well, of the are, other. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that the eczema goes, it may just was going to be going anyway. So mm. I heard a, um, a funny example once from Diana Purvis who said she tells patients, well, until your eczema is under control, we can't do the skin prick testing. <laughs> um, and then once your eczema is under control, you can say, well, now you don't need the skin prick testing. Um, but actually, I have had a couple of patients who have been told to stop their antihistamines and to stop their topical steroids. Um, whilst they've been have you know whilst they're waiting skin prick testing um, and have had quite significant flares of the eczema, one of mm. whom ended up hospitalised for an infection. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to say, I mean, I, I I've yet, yet to see skin prick testing uh, be be the sort of uh, saviour of anybody. So uh, mm. so I think it's it's uh, it's very much in its infancy. Um, so the other we, thing we're that, um, getting near end of time. Mm. So. Um, uh, one, one more question, do you ever recommend myconazole with hydrocortisone if there is a potential for infection? Now, I don't know what infection um, the uh, questioner is thinking about, but I think, you know, if it's a fungal or a yeast infection, that's never an emergency. So I'd try one and then try the other. If it doesn't work with one, then try the other. Um, I do use myconazole with hydrocortisone for nappy rash just as a way of getting it better quickly because mm. sometimes, um, uh, but if it's very, a very severe nappy rash, I'd, I will just use uh, a myconazole type thing. But certainly for regular eczema, I think there's no role for the two, uh, although there are okay. some, there are some uh, well-known prescribers in Auckland who, who have, a, uh, have a mixture, a concoction of that, mm. and it's, it's very popular, but really it's just a steroid working, I would say. Yeah, because it is often quite a potent steroid. It's a potent steroid, um, mm -hmm. and that's probably what's making it effective. It's got nothing to do with the um, with the uh, myconazole. So I would say um, uh, try and avoid the myconazole. Um, it's probably going to be the steroid that works. And again, you're going to miss the diagnosis if you use a, if you use a combination. You'll never know what it was. So I think a trial of treatment is a good idea because that does help you with the diagnostic. If it gets mm. better with steroid, well, you know that it was probably an eczema. If it doesn't and then it gets better with myconazole, then you'll know it was probably more a uh, fungal type infection or a yeast. Mm. And has it been your experience that steroid creams, if it is a fungal infection, um, steroid creams have any kind of adverse effect on the fungal infection? Oh, well, infection they, they, they make fungal infections get better in the short term, but then they come back with a hiss and a roar. Mm. So it won't go away with a steroid, you know, 
Mm. Well, if it did, then we could use it, that as a treatment, but mm. it won't go away, so then you know to try something else. But I, I much favour, I would encourage the audience to use single treatments because that way you get a diagnosis. Um, you know, you'll never get a diagnosis with Pima Food Court. Okay, secondary care issues. Mm. So this is, I guess, when we were starting our eczema oh, program, um, our goal was that we were going to be so good at managing eczema that we would never need to refer any child to paediatrics or dermatology again. Um, but actually one of the things that I am most proud of working in um, South Auckland is that we have managed to identify, I guess, the tip of the iceberg children, um, those with severe eczema that doesn't seem to respond and we've accessed them secondary services really appropriately. Um, so that's why I think reviewing people every two weeks is important to minimise harm but also to assess response. Um, and if they're not responding after four visits, then consider it. And there's no kind of issue like triggers or non-compliance. Um, then do consider referral to secondary care services. Um, there's not much in the way of red flags for eczema, um, but I guess any sort of failure to thrive would be one of those red flags. Um, and then the other one is eczema hepaticum, which is the... Um, infection with herpes simplex that you can see on the right hand lower part of the screen um, and I've always been taught to look for very kind of monomorphic or, or they're all the same size little punched out lesions um, almost like someone's taken a little hole punch to the skin um, I don't think no I've never seen it in primary care um, but my understanding is that these children are often febrile and unwell and qu in quite significant pain um, and Dermnet does list it as a dermatological emergency which mm. I wouldn't imagine there's too many of those no. so it is yeah no Stevens Johnson syndrome ex eczema hepaticum mm. yeah so do do a do a swab and probably refer um, if you're worried I don't think you want to wait for the, the culture to come back no um, you know uh, particularly a sick child I think um, and and you had that suspicion I think it would be um, mm. so I okay, so under resources, that. there was a question, what's the best um, the best place to go for information? It looks like Starship's got some pretty good... Yeah, Starship is a fabulous resource and the link is there. Um, so it's got the eczema management plans that we use, it's got the bleach bathing resources, it's also got the kids health... Um, videos as well which is the third link or you can just get them from Starship I um, mean it's a really lovely two minute long video I think each of them are about two minutes or two and a half minutes showing families how to apply their creams how to uh, apply their steroids how to bath their children um, and because we are a bit time poor in primary care so I think if we can't do those things with children or with families um, then allowing them to access that is is a efficient way of doing that right and we've got the two podcasts one on topical steroids and one on childhood eczema from paul jarrett um there's um uh, a pharmac seminar series on childhood eczema they're available on the youtube channel through pharmac there's the bpac article number 67 which is an excellent excellent article and we're just going to cross over to the red rash made easy good fellow learning um just to walk you around that so if you know that, um, then you don't need to um, uh, to stay on here. But we've just got some take-home messages. Remember that locoid is hydrocortisone butyrate, uh, is a potent steroid. Um, regular hydrocortisone, one percent is safe except on eyelids. Uh, consider the weekend option for persisting eczema. Uh, sometimes you have to educate patients to use more steroids than fewer steroids. The word puts them off, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and as Jess pointed out, quality of life um, can be quite miserable and the extensiveness of eczema is um, no measure of that. Um, education and support can be nurse-led. I think Jess's clinics are an excellent example on that. So if you're wanting to um, do better with your childhood eczema, uh, consider um, nurse-led clinics. Um, frequent large use of emollients and appropriate steroids. Uh, refer persistent and severe eczema. And what do we do with Pima Food Court, Jess? Don't use it. And Proban? <laughs> yeah, don't use that either. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's the references. Now, the references will be linked on the webinar if you want to go through to those. Um, and um, I'm just trying to get the red rash made easy. We may have to get our... Um, I, so here's the red rash made easy. So here's the diagnostic pathway here. Is the patient sick? And that gets rid of your cellulitis and petigo boil. 
is it in a classic location? So these are the classic locations. Uh, the password for this pathway is red275. This takes you through to the adult. And if you run the, the mouse over the scalp, it tells you what the common diagnostic things are. If you go to the axilla, it tells you what the common things are. Um, if you go under the, the whole body, uh, very itchy rash, it gives you um, what, what can happen. Um, there's the one for infants. So this is not for acute things, so these are for chronic things. Um, scaly hair loss is tinea capitis. Smooth hair loss is alopecia. Scaly scalp is seborrheic dermatitis. So there's a whole bunch of things there. So it's a great way to get your diagnosis. And this is the thing we talked about before. So we're just going to go back to the map. Um, if it's very itchy, then it's one of these four things here. This is very liberating. And if it's not one of these four things, then you probably need to talk to a dermatologist. Um, now, sometimes things like tinea can be very itchy. Uh, tinea cruris, for example, but a lot of tinea isn't. So this is not necessarily itchy, um, uh, but can be itchy. But these are the four. So if a patient's got a very itchy thing, you drop into this, these four here. Uh, also on the red rash made easy is um, uh, is the handbook on uh, common skin conditions, which has been written by Tanner Fishman and me. It's about 40 pages long. It's got everything you need to know. Uh, Tanner Fishman, Amanda Oakley, and I have, have run that. So, um, so that's that. Um, got a question. Does the clinic see any patients that turn up with a child? So what's your answer to that? We're not touting for business here. <laughs> Advertising. Um, for our patients, certainly if um, people walked in, I would do endeavour my best to see them. Um, and that's been part of the rationale for training all of our nurses to be skilled in eczema management, is to make it accessible and, and easy to reach people. Um, we have had a few patients with um, quite severe eczema um, who have been referred to the clinic and they've enrolled for a, a short period. Right. And do you find the other nurses get more interested because you have this expertise that, that that sort of you start educating the doctors and the nurses in the clinic? I notice you and I having very high level conversations about skin things now that you run this eczema clinic. Yeah. And I think the other side of it is that, um, you know, primary care is so extensive um, that you do really need someone pushing these things or having a yeah. champion for these things because yeah. otherwise they do very quickly fall by the wayside. Yeah. Um, so this is certainly my my soapbox. <laughs> yeah. And Jess also runs an asthma, asthma clinic, which obviously is quite handy with asthma and eczema. Well, I'd just like to, um, to thank you, the audience, for being here tonight and um, asking questions. Um, and just to thank Jess for coming along. You can see why uh, we love having her in the clinic. She's great with patients and uh, she's going to make a great nurse practitioner. So thank you for coming along, Jess. That's been a fantastic evening. And we'll close here, but we will just answer a few more questions for those of you who want to stay on there. Um, do you run any nurse training sessions for other practices? Question from Andrew. Um, I have done some training sessions for wild child tamariki order providers um, with some plans to do some plunket ones as well. Um, and Bruce kindly invited me to run a workshop at Goodfellow um, to train um, general practitioners and nurses that way. Um, but I'm also always happy to come out and speak to people on a smaller kind of group basis if that's what people are after. Yeah, no, we're very keen, I think, as, as, a, as a clinic to support. Um, we, we don't get inundated with requests for these things, so I'm sure um, we would be happy if you if you wanted uh, to get some input from Jess on, uh, on how to set up a clinic, because it's certainly been uh, a real success with the way our, our things are. Um, okay, so a question now, are the slides accessible after the webinar for download? I don't think the slides are, but they will be. This is all being recorded, so you can go back um, and uh, and get, get would you mind if people had access to your slides? Not at all. Uh, we'll we'll talk to our IT person. And um, is there some? What can we do with the slides, Paul? All of the links and the slides will be in the email, and we will see you tomorrow. Uh, all the, all the links and the slides will be in the email that Paul, our our IT genius who's sitting behind me, will be sending out tomorrow. So you'll all get that. So um, so thank you very much. Um, and good luck with your 
deprescribing a Pimafu cord, <laughs> Butacord, and um, and Foban. I'm looking forward to watching the the uh, graphs drop. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we've enjoyed ourselves very much, and thank you, Jess.